All right, I'm gonna to learn to stand back here now because I don't want to create any more feedback. Well, um, thank you very much for staying with us this afternoon. Again, my name is Dwight Flinkerbush. I'm with the Cook's Nook here in Austin, Texas. We are one of the sponsors here of this amazing event called the Future of Food. Who is enjoying themselves today, this afternoon? Yeah, you've been hearing some really good information. Has anybody learned anything new today? Yes. Raise your hand, yeah? Yeah, Has anyone didn't learn anything today? Where are you, okay. Uh, well, you know, we have had a, just an amazing afternoon here with some of these panels. You know, we've learned about some of the things that people are doing um, in different parts of the country when it comes to raising the visibility and reclaiming some of the history that has been lost, not only from a cultural perspective, but then also in terms of our food, right, and culture. Um, is, which is being restored in various different ways. We heard from people like Adrian Lipscomb. We heard from people uh, like, like Eddie Hill and people that are really doing things to create impact um, in this community. You know, in the second panel, you know, coming to a, a neighborhood, right? So we're talking about how transportation and food intersect and how do you create better access to food? You know, at the Cook's Nook, that's one of the things that really drives us to do what we do, is to really broaden access to nutrition, broaden access to good food for those communities that are either food insecure or some way and somehow nutritionally challenged. You know, and it could be a community that um, you know, doesn't have a grocery store. It could be a certain community that has certain medical conditions that have very strict diets. You know, some of us, myself included, you know, I think um, uh, Phyllis Everett mentioned the same thing. You know, I grew up where I didn't really even think about food. Food was always on the table. But now, you know, we're having an understanding, particularly in, in this county and where we're sitting here in Austin, Texas, and Travis, you know, where we, this, this city has grown incredibly fast with, uh, through tech. So it's good to see that, you know, some efforts are being made to really bring all of the community uh, together to create better impact. So it's my distinct pleasure now to um, introduce our last and our, our, our last panel, um, which is called Everything Old is Not New Again. So this is about Black Farm Legacies. And let me make an introduction here just to, uh, with our panel leader. So because this is someone that I know uh, personally, and she is always fun to, uh, to work with. <laughs> so um, on our panel today, we have Karen Washington, who is an owner and farmer for Raisin Root Farm out of the Bronx. We're very, very, very pleased to have her here with us. We have Jane Taylor with Green Thumb Farming from Pflugerville, Texas, just north of here. And Tiffany Washington um, from Dobbin Cow Farm. Oh yeah, right here, you can take whatever you want. And then this is gonna be moderated by Adrienne Lipscomb, as I mentioned before. So she is the founder and, and she's a chef and the founder of 40 Acres Project and the Maloma uh, Heritage Center. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's you again. Hey, you're on stage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. All right, so it's my distinct pleasure to introduce this panel. Thank you guys very much. Uh, I need that mic. I don't need the mic, but I need the mic. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, you can. Hey. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. We're heading towards that time. Um, we're on the last panel, am I correct? Someone shake your head? Yes, yes, so let's make this one lively, right? <laughs> hey, y'all, hey, y'all, hey, y'all. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Right. We in this thing. So as Dwight said, um, we are very privileged at this point to have some amazing women up here, black women up here. Um, especially, I want to thank them for their time and their words, because we're not just seeing black women up here, we're seeing farmers. And um, which is rare to get black women, farmers all together up here, because we work, right? You, you, you are always yeah. working. And so I want to take, you know, I want you all to understand the value of their time being on this stage. But um, one of the first things that I wanted to ask you all about was, is this your first career? It was this your career choice? I know everybody's smiling at me because <laughs> I, you know, I know, I know some people's answers, but is, was this your career choice? But also what led you to be where you are today to wanting to farm? So, hey y'all, my name is Tiffany Washington, but in my community, I am known as Nancy Farm Fancy, Farmer Nancy. So I'm in this thing. Everybody wake up, everybody wake up, clap, 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 we here. <laughs> so no, farming was not my first career. 
Um, my very first career, I was a lifeguard for the city of Austin. Um, when I was 15 years old, I started lifeguarding for the city until I was 18. And then I joined the United States Navy. So I'm a service-disabled combat veteran. So I don't really public speak, so I'm up here, you know, a little bit nervous. But, you know, I have a lot to say. So um, what brought me to farming was my PTSD and looking for healing, dealing with my PTSD. And, um, yeah, so I'm here. Been farming for five years now in the city, so. Yeah, it's amazing. And the, uh, the only black farmer within the city limits of Austin. Within so. Travis County. Within yeah. Travis County, excuse me, within Travis yeah. County. Yeah, yeah. Hi, everybody. So <laughs> my name is Karen Washington. Oh, no, farming was not my first career. Believe it or not, you can see the great. I was a physical therapist for 37 and a half years. Oh. Loved it. And then when I reached the age of 60, because I had been farming, I said to myself, you know, hmm, I want to put my hands in the ground because there was a spiritual connection to the work that I had to do and needed to be done. So I'm glad to be here with these two exceptional women. Okay. Thank you. Glad to have you. Uh, my name is Jane, and I retired from nursing last year. Um, I felt like people needed to see somebody who looks like them doing farming. And uh, there's a big connection, as we've all heard, between good food and health. And it is up to us to really lead our community to good food so that we can improve our health. You know, for those people that spoke before us, uh, for me, I immigrated from uh, Africa. And this, we know, I came from an agricultural country, yet I had not practiced agriculture or farming back home. But uh, I have since 2015 been growing food to the point where I even started selling at the local farmer's market. So I stand on your shoulders. I cannot really thank you enough for having set this platform for us, people who have come here later. But uh, I feel like I can contribute positively to encourage people to get into farming and to eat healthy. So this is not my first career. I, have, I was a nurse before this. Thank y'all so much. And, you know, you see that, and what we're starting to see very often is um, their black farmers have more than one career, especially the ones that are um, starting to get back into the land. And it's very important to respect both ends of how we got back into the soil. Um, going on with this conversation, um, one thing that was told to me was to talk about the post-reconstruction uh, of what's happening after post-reconstruction. And I said that I would be amiss if we didn't talk about the past of how we got here um, and how we came to be, quote unquote, black farmers. And I wanted to just say just a little bit of history of, of farming. And, and if you know 40 acres, and if you were, if you heard me yesterday talk about that, on how we came to one owning of land and having land, um, at one time and it was taken away. Doesn't it feel like we're kind of repeating some of that history of land ownership being taken from people um, here right now currently? I know, I know mm. these are hard. Uh, we're gonna get, and we're gonna get to the truth, right? So, <laughs> Woo. So I am a born and raised Austinite. So I am a descendant of slaves from Austin, Texas. Um, my family members were brought here to this city to farm, to do agriculture, right? So when we talk about what was done here, I brought this book. This my, this my book of receipts on the city of Austin during South by Southwest where they make millions of dollars. I like to be paid. <laughs> this right here is urban slavery in the Southwest and on the inside of this 300 page document that I used my money to print, that's why I like to be paid. Um, it talks about how disrespected black people were as slaves here in Austin, Texas. Then I also have the city of Austin 1928 plan. Grab that, grab that, grab that, cause it's going down. 
the city of Austin 1928 plan where they segregated the city and put all the black people in one district. That totally eliminated our black farming communities here. So then I also have this email that I wrote and I sent out on February 5th, 2021. This, the subject is institutional racism against black farmers in Austin, Texas, Travis County. And it says, good morning all. This email is meant to inform and express my anger, disappointment and trauma on record concerning the institutional racism within the city of Austin and Travis County's agricultural infrastructure. Food policy board, food system, food access initiatives, training and programming, which explicitly disrespects, excludes and exploits the hard work and efforts of today's black farmers, the descendants of American slaves that built this community. Today we endure these atrocities while facing failing access to COVID-19 vaccines and health care support east of IH-35. My name is Tiffany Washington. I'm a 36-year-old born and raised Austinite who has seen firsthand the covert racism of this city. I'm a black farmer, a service-disabled combat veteran, and mother of four black children struggling to simply feed my neighbors. I currently own and operate a small scale agribusiness in Northeast Austin, Texas, District 1. My services support Colony Park, University Hills, Pecan Springs, Martin Luther King, and Springdale to Airport Boulevard, neighborhoods 78724, 2321, and 02. These historically black neighborhoods have become blatantly gentrified communities embedded with the effects of COVID 19, crime, violence homelessness and a lack of resource supporting marginalized families being overlooked as local developers continue to push them out. In my time here as a farmer, I have worked tirelessly to the point of exhaustion and been triggered on several occasions by the actions of local leadership, nonprofit organizations and institutions that have brushed aside my service, credibility and support from within the community. Whether it is a matter of tokenizing my voice or throwing a dog bone to, me, to silence me, the discrimination is clear. Unless I act accordingly with grace and kindness for my oppressor, my needs as a black farmer in a community where black farmers do not exist, you all could care less about the lack of equity held by myself, let alone black people whose families have called Austin home for over 170 years. I refuse to stand by and accept this city's liberal abuse agendas quietly any longer. The black farming communities of Austin, Texas were destroyed purposefully by policy, gatekeeping, and structural racism that, fell, that falls in line with the removal of black farmers from the land across the United States. This is nothing new. The implementation of programs that pretend to uplift marginalized communities by training new and beginning farmers in agriculture and leadership, such as Urban Roots and Farm Share Austin, have not done the work necessary to warrant the large sums of grant funding which flow through their hands year after year. I have become an inspiration and trusted confident within my community and have shouldered the burden of their complaints on my own. As a farm share alumni, I can testify to the lack of verbal open support for myself, black farmers, and others who seem to be left with little to no outreach during this COVID-19 pandemic. I can testify to the number of young black men who have participated in Urban Roots and who've gone on to find themselves in the juvenile justice system, system or prison because they could not find agricultural focused jobs due to racial injustice, fund their own agribusinesses due to the lack of access to land and capital, and who were not taught the value of agriculture in black communities, that of which every black Wall Street ever bombed literally or through policy in America depended upon. Our children have been used for the financial games of others, period. I share these sentiments on the aftermath of a Food Policy Board working group meeting in February 2nd, 2021, during Black History Month that completely disrespected Black, Mexican, and Native American farmers while discussing the Urban Farm Ordinance Land Acknowledgement and an Agrarian Land Trust proposed by a former farmer of La, La Flaca Farm a new policy board member, a board in which I applied to with letters of recommendation, yet would not, did not receive a phone call in regards to. As the only black farmer in attendance, I was triggered as I listened 
to a Mexican-American immigrant discussed creating a sharecropper's trust on native soil with not one Native American on the call. In the summer of 2020, as COVID ripped our community apart, I expressed to her that this would need to go into the community and gain support from Mexican-Americans. I wasn't heard. I myself had to listen as agri-hoods were discussed with the knowledge that these progressive liberal ideas are intended for the Conley Park District. The urban farm communities ran by white farmers in our hoods, such as Boggy Creek Farm, have never been referred to as agri-hoods. It's appalling. Regardless of my efforts to remain open and supportive of these people and programs by sharing or promoting them on my platforms with no reciprocity while overlooking the trauma caused to me by them, I persevere among soft-handed allyship, finding my passion in my work while shining a light on this grave dilemma. The city of Austin got me messed up. So I want to just be respectful of time, and I know you have a lot to say. The it city is, of Austin got me messed up. Yeah. I, 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 I will let you take a breather and I want to do be respect on everyone's time. And I know that this is so important in the Austin level, but I also want to bring it back to the nation itself. And Karen, um, I wanted to talk to you about your, the space and the space you came into in the farming and, and what happened? Where did you see yourself and where do you see it going right now at this time for black farmers? First of all, I wanted to commend Tiffany for having the strength yes. and fortitude to say what's going on because she's not alone. She's not alone what is happening with black agriculture throughout this country, not only in Austin, but out this country where we have been told that and we have been tokenized when it comes to owning land and having the resources to farm. This didn't start yesterday. If we look back at our history, why were we brought here? We were brought here because of our knowledge of agriculture. We brought the seeds in our hair to feed this country. We were the ones who put the brick in order to build these buildings that you see. And yet we were pushed aside when it came to land access. Every bill, every legislative piece had been, had been brought to prevent black ownership of land, of property, and of resources. Believe it or not, in the early 19, early 1800s, I'm sorry, 1900, there were more black farmers than white farmers. Sure was. But yet, when you look at the laws that were put in place, the GI Bill, Homestead Act, can you believe at one time, one time in, in 1865, when, when President Lincoln met with his, his general, general Sherman to sit with black preachers and said, I'm gonna do this thing called the Special 15 Act, which will give black people, enslaved people, 400,000 acres of land. But when President Lincoln died, President then Andrew Johnson said, hell no. And that Look land that. went back to white slave owners. Couldn't you imagine a wealth yeah. we would have today? And so what Tiffany is saying is true. We have been displaced. We have been negated. We have been pushed off our land. And now the new thing is gentrification. And I'm saying that because I'm talking to white folks out there. Because there's no way in hell that you know with your, your privilege and your color of your skin that you go into black and brown neighborhoods and people leave and you don't question it. And you don't question the history around how we got here. We're at a point in time where you know what? It's time for white allies to speak up and speak out because we're tired. This child is tired. She tired. We are tired of always trying to speak up. Where are the white voices it's okay. that are going to be out there speaking up they and right speaking here. out? In resolution number uh, We're 2021. We're tired of tokenism. That's tokenism. The city of Austin. That's tired of that's allyship. Yep. Pass the resolution. We got to do the work. You got, you got to do the work, y'all. White folks got to do the work because I want to be paid because if you don't 
do the work. We gonna starve to death. Slavery will continue to happen. Displacement will continue to happen. Gentrification will continue to happen. But you know what? If you allow it to happen and you keep pushing and pushing, pushing us off the land, we're going to come and we're going to take it. There's going to be a new revolution. Either you share power, give it up, or it's going to be taken away. New revolution. Think about it. It's up to you to change the policy and the way this country is being run. I want to hear your voices. Yep. And I, and I have to say. I have, and, I have to follow this, that, Adrian. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Well, you know, hey, we were seats. Yeah. Like I'm telling you, like, this is going to be, this is, we telling the truth, right? Like we're going to be, we're going to come out here and let y'all know what exactly is going on. I mean, Tiffany, I know this, this is a lot. And emotionally, like Tiffany, I have never met, but we, but we follow each other. We, and we, we talk and spiritually talk with each other. And, and it got, it got you up on your feet. And this, this is things that we've experienced every day, every night, 24 seven, this is what happens. And then now to have a platform to be able to say it to y'all, you know, this isn't the first time we've said it, right? This is not the first time you've no. ever heard it. You may have heard it in a different way, but I want to give a little opening for Jane too, because Jane, Jane, you're not from the United States, I'm right? Not. She's I'm not, not. But I call this home. Now. But you call this home oh, now? Sorry. Yeah, no. I was like, where you might go. Um, you you step into this, and, and and what do you see? What do you what do you see from coming you know coming from the motherland to here, and the experience of African Americans with food and gentrification and poverty within you know Austin? Let's just say Austin in this area. Okay, so uh, let me give you a little bit of history. I am from Kenya. We were colonized by the British. And exactly what happened here happened there. In the sense that when the British came, they took what was the fertile land and pushed our communities into what was the equivalent of segregation, although segregated in your own country. So. The land that was really fertile and productive, which is uh, the highlands, was taken by the white people, and they used this land to grow their wheat, their coffee, their tea, and all that. So the same history that we as immigrants read was actually happening back home. And I have seen this as I was looking for land in the past two years or so, I realized that not at one time did I see land around me that was being sold by a black family. All the families, all the places that, re that the realtor took us was actually land that was owned by white people. And you know, here when I say white people, I'm just using the term that is comfortable with me. So yes, as somebody who's come from outside, we have seen this. We might not have experienced it right here the way you did, your land being taken away from you and you not being compensated in any way. But we actually went through the same thing. And I remember at one time, I went to see this uh, property that I was interested in and the guy who was acting as the broker uh, told my realtor, well, if she can't afford it, she needs to go somewhere else where she can afford. And that was way out there in Rockdale, which is like an hour and a half from where I live. So it, this is not something new. We understand it. And we, as much as we read this in history, we can see and feel your feelings. I, I feel what these two ladies have just expressed here. I feel it and understand it. And so this is what 40 Acres of My Project is about, is getting these stories out and heard more, but also preserving this legacy, right? Because it is, what we're seeing is what, 1.3% of farmers are black mm -hmm. now? You know, the numbers are coming out, and even though you're, we're talking about supporting black farmers and you're seeing, seeing things on social media about supporting black farmers, are we really supporting black farmers, right? I like to be paid. And 
and you know, speaking on the part of paid, you know, you're bringing it up. Well, if we're going to be talking about funding, so I and and this was a topic that Karen definitely want us to talk about was uh, was talking about funding. So everybody knows, and if you don't know, you need to look it up about the Black Farmers Fund. And the Black Farmers Fund, and and, and to tell you, I was in conversations before it went it went to Congress um, with USDA. You know calling my phone and I'm like, I, you know, I'm this one person at the time I was in Wisconsin, you know, trying to have a conversation about what should we do with this money? And I said, give it to the black farmers. And I said, and on top of that, my interest wasn't just paying the black farmers, but how is this going to be, how is this going to be sustainable? Just because you give money, how is it going to be sustainable? How are you going to, I thought it was like a feel good thing, but how is that going to be sustainable? And then my next question to them was like, how, and I'm gonna ask y'all too, is how do you create a successful black farmer? I don't know if anybody can answer that. They couldn't. By paying them. <laughs> and I think funding is definitely one, but how do you keep them successful in the knowledge and part of the economy? Because I can give you the money, but what else? What else do you need to be a successful black farmer? Um, I can answer that maybe in a very short way. Now, reading through what has been going on, especially in uh, HBCUs, the agricultural departments or programs have been historically underfunded right. so that students who maybe thought they might veer towards farming, they don't even get the information and education they need because the funding is not there for them. Now, our community colleges, we are not funding them well enough where we can encourage younger generation because at some point we're gonna retire from farming. Farming is hard work. So we need younger people really getting into this, but it all comes down to funding. We need organizations to come out, support the local uh, farm share organizations that can keep growing farmers. We need local markets, local uh, companies to support farmers as in opening a way for them to be able to market their produce to them or for them to buy the produce from the farmers and distribute it to those people who need it. So it all go, comes down to funding and education and information and infrastructure. Now, if you give me a piece of land today and you didn't give me the money to buy a tractor. You didn't give me the money to set up the irrigation system. You didn't give me the money to pay workers, to pay employees. That is just a piece of land. It is a piece of land. It's just like saying, well, here is a piece of land. If you wanted to construct, if I don't have the funds to do it, it's just exactly that. So funding, funding, funding. Fund farmers, when they go to the bank to apply for money to buy land, let us make it easier. Let us have channels that people can actually be able to get the money to buy land. And in, the, in, in that context too, let us avail money for them to operate those farms once they acquire them. And I, and I also, you know, since I did bring up the Black, the Black Farmers Fund, and if people do not know, it's being held up in court. And um, it was stopped like within minutes of distribution. So you're talking about the state of Wisconsin was one farmers out of there, went to a lawsuit in the state of Texas. So the state I left and then the state I came home to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, imagine how I'm feeling about that. Mm -hmm. But where's this money? You have farms during COVID that are not surviving. Like we know farmers are having a hard time, correct? But now imagine the black farmer and, how, and what were they doing before? Because they were suffering before and no one was talking about them. But now, they're, they're shuttering. They're closing their doors and they're barely surviving. So at this point, funding is one of the number one things. But to me, it's only part of the problem. It's only part of the problem, part of the solution that's not coming down the way. So I would like to say, just pay me. I don't need extra organizations trying to dictate what I do as a black farmer. I've been dealing with that for like 400 years. Just pay me so I can pay this young black man over here who's interested in agriculture to go farm. 
and then handle my business, and then I'm gonna pay his homeboy and his homeboy, and we gonna keep farming. I don't need nothing else. I got somebody at the bank that can help me with my business. I don't need all these extra organizations. We asking where the money at. The organizations got the money. The city of Austin pushed through millions of dollars. Not one of them organizations reached out to the only black farmer and said, Tiffany, let me pay you to grow food for the hood. I don't wanna hear no more of this stuff. It makes me me nervous. This right here said that the city of Austin apologized for racism. Since the inception, Austin, Texas has depended on the agriculture of black slaves and bonded servants. In 200 years of progress, Austin has yet to address or fully commit to allowing black residents equal opportunities to enjoy this advancement. <sighs> I want to be paid. Why? Because Boggy Creek sits on a plantation, an antiquated plantation, and they don't talk about that. But everybody in Austin go buy their food from Boggy Creek. Johnson Backyard Garden. Right now, we don't know where Brendan Johnson is, but we do know that he ran off on the whole city CSA with millions of dollars from PPP and FSA and USDA. I want to be paid. And Tiffany, I'm like, like I'm no, gonna, no, Adrian, I, I, because I'm not finished, because we I talked know. about gentrification. When they said my farm may cause gentrification, I got this email on March 31st. That's days after March 4th, when they said that they apologized for slavery in the city of Austin. Dear Tiffany, your idea was reviewed by community members who participate in Dell Medical School's Department of Pub Population Health Community Strategy Team and the University of Texas. Do you want to know what they said? I wonder if this may increase gentrification once people find out. I asked them if they knew I was black. How you gonna tell me my black owned business is gonna create gentrification? That tells me that y'all think black people don't give a fuck about food. I want to be paid, period, point blank. I want to be paid. I came to this event I didn't get paid. I came here and I did not get paid during South by Southwest where all these people come from wherever the hell they coming from to pray on my community during South by Southwest and Tiffany Washington, Farmer Nancy wants to be paid. I don't know about nobody else, but I want to be paid. I don't want to wait 30 years to still be standing here talking to y'all about getting Paid, Bay, can you please bring me some water because my mouth getting dry. I want to be paid. I don't know if I'm going to get put out of here, but I would like to be paid. I don't want to have to go through no organizations and get a sponsorship and have to do none of that shit. I don't want to have to go and ask nobody to direct or dictate my money. I want my money and I want it now. Whatever black organizations got money to feed the village and didn't pay the only black farmer here, y'all need to run me my check. Yes. Thank you. All right. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Come on. So. Come on. Yeah, I want to I wanna sort of talk to what Tiffany is talking about because we had the same problem in New York City. So out of 57,000 farmers in New York City, out of 57,000 farmers in New York City, only 139 are black. So we go, we go to, we go to the governor to ask for $9 million. Now think about it, black folks asking the governor for $9 million. And so we were laughed at. So you know what we did? We said, you know what? We're going to tell our story and we're gonna put it out there for the needs of black farmers in New York State. And we started a black farmer fund. And the reason why we started a black farmer fund because we needed to make sure that people understood the plight of the black farmer, but also to educate our people around our history and about financial education and resources. And so it was a community-based fund developed by people who looked like us. And you know what? To this day, we have a mess over $3 million. Yep. $3 million from the community to support us so that we can be self-sufficient and self-reliant. 
We don't want charity. And I think what's, what Stephanie is talking about, Tiffany is talking about, is charity. We don't want charity. Give us a chance. Support the work that she and all of us are doing so that we can do the work. Not just give us money, but understand that the money that we have will be within the community. The, 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 the community itself controls that money. Controls that money in a way that helps support black farms and black businesses. To this day, we're able to, to support right now eight black farms and black businesses of not only giving them startup money, but educating them about what investment looks like, uh, how to repair uh, credit, how to get a loan and pay it back, how to receive a grant, but then also how to circulate that money within the black community so it can stand on its own. And also to invest in getting land, land ownership, because land ownership, folks, is our legacy and our history. And when black land is lost, our history and our legacy is lost in the American history, not a city or state history. When black land is lost, it's lost in the American history, the American legacy. And this is why it is so important for each and every one of you to speak up and speak out when you see the injustices that are happening. And I think this is why she's so frustrated because she's in this city and y'all are not listening to what she is trying to do. She's not asking for y'all to pat her on the back and say you're doing a good work. You know, there are nonprofits out there that got money. Nonprofits that are white led, that are out there, that use us to make sure that you have funding. You'll need to come together, listen to what this child is saying, and support the work that she is doing. Support the work that we are doing. Support the work because at the end of the day, food is a human right. And we should not be begging for food on food pantries and soup kitchens. We should be happy to grow our own food, have our own land, and have our own housing. This is America, folks. This is the land of opportunity. And opportunity needs to be for each and every one of us. Can't you see that? Why are we blind by that? What is it about that makes us so different? that we cannot help one another. Because at the end of the day, when you help poor people, you yourself get stronger. When you help the people at the bottom, you yourself are brought up to the top. And so when you see poverty and hunger, shame the politician, shame people, because in the United States, it should not be. If you walk across someone who's homeless, it should not be. Clothe them, feed somebody, but we have to do this together. And they did not need me for any of this. Let me tell you, having Tiffany here and being able to give a portion of platform to see her emotions and anger over what the reality is of black farmers in not even just Austin, but the United States, but this is happening in your back door, like right outside, right in your backyard, it's happening. And to see that she's one, the only one here, and that the last one at this moment, there's no support to bring another black farmer right now. Why isn't there? Why isn't there funding? Where's the education? Where are the classes? Where's the mentorship? She's it. There's not, this is not just an Austin issue, but there are organizations that can step up. There's organizations that can help my organizations, these organizations that are here. Jane, you're right outside of Austin right now. Mm -hmm. She's sitting right here. This is a conversation, this is network. That's why I said it's been so valuable to have these people come off their land because they're farmers, they're feeding their community. And when we're saying community, we're talking Austinites. 
we're not just talking around in their area where they're located at, we're talking about the city because these people are part of our city. They help make it run. They're your services. They're the ones that have those service jobs that are in need of food. These are the people that are providing them food and that are asking organizations, all these nonprofits, asking the government, please pay me. I can feed my people. I'm a trusted leader within my community that are, they're watching me grow healthy food. Because what are we seeing right now? We're having seeing health issues, right? Within all our communities, not just the black community, all communities. And half of that is nutrition, right? Our schools, y'all know about our schools, right? Like you know about the food, the food policy and the, the food shortages in schools right now? We have schools that have lost their vendors and you're talking major vendors and they're like feeding them from McDonald's right now at this point because that is the only way that they can get food to kids. Farmers becoming part of vendors of the system, of the school system is difficult. It takes too long to give them food that's around the corner from them. People like this, who are here saying that we will feed our people and we will find a way to feed our people. And they're not saying they're feeding black people, they're feeding everyone. Mm -hmm. They're feeding everyone. And I have to say, you know, Jane, Jane and I met because when I moved back to, when I moved back to Austin, I went to the farmer's market. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I saw a black farmer in Texas at the farmer's market. Yeah. And, I, and I, I went hunting, there's two. And I went hunting and we didn't know we were speaking or know it. And I was like, I know her because I, I went and I hunted. And she must have thought I was crazy because I was like screaming. And then she was like, this girl has lost her mind. She's over here talking about a farmer. Because that's even getting a black farmer into the farmer's that's market mm -hmm. is difficult. You know, think about it. When you have to say part of your mission is to take a percentage and make sure that it's equitable. Are you really being equitable? Like, were you ever equitable? That's a, that's a question to me. But also, a farmer is a business. And I know I'm talking over y'all and y'all stop me and please jump in. But a farmer is a business, right? They're entrepreneurs, but they need help getting into that door, getting their businesses. When do you ever see a black farmer? When? When do you see them? No, we the help. We the help, right? We, we the help. Mm -hmm. or, or, or you see them on the side of the road in a truck trying to sell their product mm -hmm. because they're not in the farmer's market or know how to get access into the farmer's market or even part of the distribution system itself mm -hmm. to get to Whole Foods, to get to HEB, to get to your local grocery store. So it's not just a search and look for these people they exist, we are out here. They're just not in those spaces. And that's what you have to start questioning and asking. And as a chef, I made it, made it part of my mission to be diverse, to understand the food, to understand the culture, because not all farmers are growing the same damn tomato. Mm -hmm. Some people have been growing the same sweet potato for over 75 years and people don't know. Like that type of effort to really understand where your food is coming from and staying local or hyper local if you can, those are the efforts that you're doing to keep the dollar within the community longer. This is, this is a hard, difficult topic, y'all. I'm glad that y'all are here just sort of listening to our plight because we got scars, we got trauma. You know, we on the outside looking and dope and stuff but deep down inside we have trauma and we have scars because we see our culture co-opted we see our food ways and cuisine co-opted we see the way we grow our food co-opted and labeled different like regenerative agriculture and permaculture wait, wait, wait a second wasn't that the indigenous people started that stuff you know I, I sit I sit in a sea of whiteness in, in, in conferences, in workshops, and I can count on in my hand how many people look like me, and I sit there and I'm hearing the frame of agriculture white-centered. How do you think I feel when no one even mentions George Washington Carver? Never even mention it, but I sit down and I'm listening and I say to myself, when are they gonna talk about my contribution to agriculture? I look on TV and I see all these barbecue shows and all these cuisine, and I'm saying, wait a second, 
Isn't that okra? Didn't we bring okra here? You know, and, and I'm saying, well, where, where is our place in cuisine and in food ways? Where is it? It's been co-opted. And we have been just brushed to the side. But let me tell you, folks, it's a new day now. Because we have chefs like Adrian and others that are out there saying, hell no. We have to stop the madness. And so, folks, either you're going to join us or you're going to be left behind. COVID has changed the way we look at each other, the way we look at food, the way we in interact with each other. And now it's time in this moment to change the food system so that it's fair, so that it's just, so that it's equitable. And again, it's time for people with power and privilege to step up to the plate, because I'm tired. I am tired, we are tired as black folks carrying the burden, marching in the streets while y'all just sit back and watch. You nod and you agree, but you gotta be out there, out there in front, pounding on the doors of legislators, marching in the street and demanding change. Because if I don't see y'all out there, people with power and privilege, then you know what? Food justice and food sovereignty are just words. Jane, you have anything to add to that? Um, yes. Yes, please do. <laughs> this, is a, this is a platform that's open. What, um, what I would like to finish by saying is that as a community, we all have the responsibility to make sure Bring your mic up a bit. oh sorry <laughs> i keep forgetting that uh, we have a responsibility to making to make sure that everybody who needs food can be able to get food it's not difficult those of us who are venturing into farming now uh, new and upcoming farmers and also people who've been doing this for quite a minute we are ready to put in the hard work we are ready to put in the hard work to make sure that we are producing good, healthy food that can, in effect, be transported or be able to be given to those who are really in need in our communities. There is no reason, as somebody said, there's no reason for a city as rich as Austin to have so many numbers of people who are going hungry every day. There's absolutely no reason. And we are here, I'm putting a face to people maybe who were not born here and saying that yes, we can also do farming here and we can also contribute to this society that has welcomed us and be able to produce the food that is needed here in this city. And I have to bring something up. So the, the freeze, I wasn't here during y'all's freeze. I was probably in negative 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. But to tell you that the hunger and the identification of how many people were going hungry was brought forth because a different class of people were going hungry. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening was like, we need to do something. But right now, where we're standing right here, people are still hungry. Mm -hmm. There are people who are still are going, going to bed without food, your children. Some children are not going, you know, they're not getting food. This is not something that just started because of the freeze. It was always there. It all has always been there. What are we going to do about that? We have people here who are wanting to grow that food for their community that are having a difficult time within the system to even buy land or to even have access to land to grow food. So like I said, it's beyond the money. You can give me the money to the buy the land, but how am I going to grow on this land? How am I going to till this land? How am I going to add water to this land? How am I going to take care of permits? Mm -hmm. How do I become a, you know, get my farming number? How do I, you know, there's so many more things than so just many. giving, giving me a piece of land. And I think that's what one thing that I learned about this in, in doing 40 acres, it's more than land, right? Mm -hmm. But guess what? Everybody has to eat in some way, in some form. It, food did not care that my skin color is black. Mm -mm. Food does not care that you are white. It is there for all, and it should be there for all. 
Absolutely. So I know we at zero and I was told I got a little bit more time. <laughs> hey. And I'm I want to kind of open the floor for a couple questions. And I know I don't want y'all to be quiet. I mean, I find this to be kind of a safe space. <laughs> and I think you should be able to ask uh, questions. It, it, no, there's no stupid question, really. There's no, you have valuable knowledge and people of experience sitting up here. So if you have a question, please. Uh, yes, what was Tiffany's cash app again? <laughs> Can we I'm get that? I'm so serious. Oh, no, I'm- Don't me. There you go. No, say it louder. Dobbin Cow Farm. It's a GoFund. Oh, thank you. At Farmer, Dobbin Cow Farm. It's a GoFund. Farmer Nancy D yeah. is her cash app, yeah. just so y'all know. Yep. Well, yeah. thanks. Can no. I just say something? Because I think, who was it? Mr. Ashton was here. There's a farm here. Uh, Alexander, I think is the name of the farm that's been here since the 1800s. The only black farm. And they're getting a lot of pushback because people want to take that land. This is the opportunity for you all to come together to save that land, make sure that that land is a historical preservation spot. Why should that land of the only black farmer of land in the 1800s that's been here and people are trying to push that family out? This is the opportunity for you all to come together to make sure that that black farm stays here in your city. And it's supported because if that farm goes, then what is the legacy of Austin letting it go a black farm that's been here since the 1800s? Now is the time for y'all to step up and make sure that when I come back again here in a couple of years, that that is a historic site preserved by you all getting together to make sure that that farm stays here forever. Do I have more time? She can hit yes or no. Oh, I'm sorry, more questions? Any questions out here? Come on, y'all. This was the, the most liveliest one we've had. Come on. <laughs> I see a question over here. I know y'all got questions. Hey, thanks a lot. Uh, so one thing that I think it was you, Jane, touched on, maybe, maybe it was somebody else, the importance of new farmers and the human resource to come in to farming um, can you speak on how to bridge that gap that we're facing? I don't know if I'm the right person to be speaking about that, but what I know is that just like in any profession, let's just realize that farming is a profession by itself and it is an economic source for those who do it. And, um, you know, so in, in any profession we have a generation that is coming in, a generation that's already there, and a generation that's getting out. So for those who have never really paid any attention to where their food come from, food comes from, it comes from people like us working on the land. Um, we need to encourage younger people, our children, our neighbors. Like I started this in my backyard, just growing food that I was giving to friends and families. And then eventually my children were like, this is too much food. We need to be able to look for an outlet for it. That's how we came to the farmer's market. And you know, as small as our space was, I'm glad that SFC, the local uh, farmer's market community here, allowed us to come in. We need to figure a way to encourage people who could be interested in becoming farmers. How do we do that? We have the resource like at FarmShare, but it doesn't have to be the only one. We have mentoring, we, we visited different farms that you can actually go and hang out with Adrian and learn something from her because she has been doing this. So there are channels that we can use, and as I said before, why don't we look at our policymakers? Why don't we fund our community colleges? Why don't we insist to have departments of agriculture that can actually give people the education and information that they need? Because this, why I went to FarmShare is I realized I can grow food, but I also needed to do this as a business. 
you learn all those things there. How do you plan? How do you manage your money? It's, it's a whole science in itself. You don't just wake up one day and start running a farm that is 10 acres and, and think you're going to make money. You have to learn how to do it and do it well. And we can start this by middle school. Let's start by teaching young kids. Where does your carrot come from? There are a lot of kids who don't know where food comes from. Where does your egg that you eat at breakfast comes from? They have no idea. Why? Because we as parents have not taken the initiative to encourage our own children to even find out. Like, do, kids, do our kids even know that a chicken has only two drumsticks? No, they see a whole package of drumsticks and they think, oh, that is chicken. Do they know that how many chicken have to be slaughtered to have all those drumsticks that are in that package? We, the people, we, we can make that difference. We can bridge that gap by making that child curious. Huh? So if there are two drumsticks, how come now we are having all these drumsticks on the table? So many chicken had to be killed. Now, is that a solution to every problem? Probably not. But it could lead us to getting more farmers involved. And my face right here, having an accent coming from a different country and saying, I will do farming in America. It's a risk. I know there's so many things that are beyond my control. The weather, the lack of land, the lack of financing. But I'm still going to give it a shot. And years from now, I hope, I will be a positive story that Adrian will be telling people. Yeah. I, I also want to say there are black farming organizations that do this. They just don't have the funding or they were never pumped with the funding to continue on this information. But there are organ farm organizations that are not reaching out to these black organizations that are, that are doing this or reaching out to black farmers to say, we would like to be an ally. How can we help? How can we get further into this? And how can we spread this knowledge that other black people, if they're interested, they can come to them now. It's, there's, a, there's a gap. There's a communication gap and there is trust issues within it. So there is large and a huge trust issue within farming. There's a lot of violence. There was a lot of death. There was a lot of land grab. So there, we're still recovering from this. This isn't old. I think people are like, I'm talking like 1900s. We're talking less than 100 years. And, and we're talking less than 50 years on a lot of this, what we're talking about. Pigford was just, was in our generation. So, you know, the Pigford case. So I, I, I'm just telling you, like, there's a lot of scars, like, like Karen said, there's a lot of scars, there's a lot of fresh wounds still, and we're still making them. We're still making them. Another question? Hi, yes, I wanna say, oh, first off, thank you so much for your time today, um, your knowledge and your education. I just wanna say I feel really impacted. I'm just really honored to hear from both of you today. Um, but on top of that, I wanna piggyback off of that question. Now, if we're thinking about um, big kids, adults, what would be a simple form of education for them to kind of get an awareness of the industrial complex, I guess, from a, a like a, a more basic education kind of understanding. Like, is there simple adjustments to going to the organizations or is there just, you know, a direct book reference that you guys have any like first steps towards? Apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I was just, my cab driver, your Uber driver was talking about wanting to get into farming. And I said, well, you're interested in farming you go to a farmer's market and ask a farmer, can I be on your farm? Can I, can I come on your farm and can I see, can I learn? Let me see what you're doing. A lot, and a lot of us don't do that. A lot of us as, as black folks don't do it because we don't see farmers that look like us. And so a lot of it has to be from word of mouth, from our elders that talk about how it was to farm and how it was to garden. But it starts early. It starts early educating black and brown folks the history of agriculture. How hard it is, but it's, we're not defined by slavery. I grew up and, and agriculture was defined by slavery. It wasn't until I was an adult to really find the true meaning of why my people were brought here. We need to tackle that, but yet, right now in schools, 
They don't want us to talk about race or sexual orientation. Why? Because I'm telling you, this is what I'm having in my head. I'm saying that I can see a white child saying to grandpa, so grandpa, how do we get this land? I heard maybe, you know, back in the day that so-and-so had a land. People are afraid to open up that Pandora's box on how land was gotten. And so instead of talking about it, let's just silence. Because if you're silencing people about the conversation about race or the conversation about sexual orientation, you're hiding something. You're hiding the truth. But you know what? The truth is gonna come out sooner or later. Again, we as people are instruments of educating people. Educating people the truth. Because right now, they're being fed falsehoods. And falsehoods only continue to perpetuate the racism, the sexisms, all of the isms that you continue to see in this country. Great question. I also would like to say, you know, as an adult, whew, I can take more questions, hey. Um, as an adult and being a part of this industry, plant something. Plant something in your backyard. Plant something you like to eat. If you like a tornado, plant a tomato or look them up and see which tomato you never heard of. Plant it, grow it, see, see how it goes. Do another one because I tell you, it's not just gonna grow one tomato. It's gonna grow more than you can eat. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you give that away or you hold on to the seeds and you share the seeds. You continue it on. That's literally, I bought my first house and the first thing I did was plant because I said, my children are going to learn. So it's always was about the next, the next legacy. Like who, what am I leaving it for? So plant something, plant a bell pepper. It's about, we about to be in the season of what? Does anybody know what season we're in? Can't hear you. Broccoli, what else? It's about to get hot. So tomatoes, peppers, okra, uh, strawberries. You know, there's, there, there's a lot. Plant something, grow it, see if you like it. Go to the farmer's market, they got it, ask them, how'd you grow it? How'd you grow so many of them? Lead from that way. And let me tell you, the farmers are lonely. They love to talk. We love to talk. And then they're a good farmer. You ask them to go, can I come visit your property? I trust and believe I've already been to four or five farms since being here and I haven't been here that long. Maybe you shouldn't say, can I come visit? You can say, can I come volunteer? And yes. then I'll, you know, you can help pull some weeds mm -hmm. and go home with some food. Let me tell and you, you're not, you're, really, yeah, you're not gonna go home hungry. No, they go, you're gonna no, walk out. You with something. always walk out with some food. Yeah. yeah, I got a question up here. Hello, how you all doing? Uh, my name is Chris from Black Land Ownership. One of the things um, I noticed it was hard to get centralized information. So, like on our site, we try to provide a list of Black farmers. So, for people who want to know, we have a nationwide list and resources for folks. But a question I'd want to ask: I live in Brooklyn, and when I'm talking to my friends, they're like, well, we don't necessarily want to be farmers, but we want to help. Now, we need graphic designers to help us. We need people who are in marketing, publicity. There are a lot of arenas. Um, from you all's perspectives, what are some of the other supporting roles? So for the people that aren't ready to get their hands in the dirt or aren't ready to start a farm, how can they be of assistance more than word of mouth? Because obviously we need active word of mouth and legislation and those methods as well. So in New York City, we started this thing called the ecosystem. And the way we say that, because again, what we found is this is what people do. They put nonprofits in a barrel and they dangle the money. And all the nonprofits grab at, like crabs in a barrel. So we said, you know what? We came together as black run organizations and says we're no longer going to accept that. That if you want to fund black agriculture per se, you have to fund the whole ecosystem. So we have one organization, NIFOC, that does land. We have two organizations that, that, that do education, that's Farm School and Soul Fire. We have another organization that does funding, Black Farmer Fund, and another organization, Corbett Hill, that does distribution. And so this is the nuance on how to, again, look at people's, look, look at people's uh, uh, preferences, but also take, take their intelligence. What is it that they can give to organizations to build, to build that community, that collaboration that's needed? Farming, you cannot farm alone. 
No ifs, ands, or buts. If you're going to farm, you got to think about farming collectively, coming together with certain parts because you need you need funding, you need land, you need distribution, you need training, you need all those components. And so now what you're starting to see, and funders are starting to get the idea, we don't want to fund just one organization. But if you work collectively, they can now see, you know what? Their money is going to make a difference because you have that cohesion of organizations coming together to, to stem the tide of a particular problem, which is hunger, poverty, land loss, education, distribution, all of the things that we need, we, we, we need in agriculture. Excellent question. Now, maybe I can add to that. Um, for all the farmers, and I mean, people who do not have the technological capability to like market for themselves or even like to operate, you know, things that are, are now coming up, new technology. P younger people who, are, who have that knowledge can help those older farmers to maneuver and to be able to use those systems to their benefit. Now, for example, what I'm talking about is if it's uh, an irrigation system that needs to be set and be controlled through the phones, you know, somebody's phone, an older person, and I classify myself as an older person, <laughs> might not know how to go through that to set it well. It is something that you who cannot contribute physically on the land, you know, like working on the land, you can help those farmers do that. You know, sometimes it's operating the equipment. They might need somebody on the ground to, to read that manual for them and say, you know, that's the button you move, this, this is what you, you touch for the screen to come on so that you're able to operate that machinery or equipment. And I'll, I'll, I mean, I'm gonna jump in on this question too, I'm sorry, I'm not even supposed to be on this panel. <laughs> but um, I also just wanna say is like over 65% over of black farmers are over the age of 55. That's large when you're talking about 1.3% of far black farmers. They, and then I would say what, is it like close to 80% of them don't have like technology or internet? So that help is needed to show and to understand what distribution has turned into. The technology of how now we're working so fast in our world, how do we get our farmers up to that capability to be able to farm? You know when we saw this happening was during COVID when people started seeing that there was no more food in the farmer's market, what did they do? You went to social media, you went to the farmer's market, you started making collectives and trying to figure out where I can get food from farmers. And farmers started telling their story, like I am a farmer, I have three kids, I'm two generations deep. And you started hearing their stories. So listen to them, listen to them and see where they're going. I think that's really huge. Okay, I have a question over here, I'm so oh. sorry. Thank you for waiting. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Asentua um, from Secret Food Stories. Um, I like what Karen talked about, and I'm in um, aligned with that about telling the influences of black people and African ingredients in the culinary world. I come from the culinary world. I studied in Cape Town, South Africa, and even there in, our Cape, in Cape Town Hotel School, the culinary curriculum is still French based, European based. I come to America, it's the same thing, and we add um, now there's a trend of adding a subject or a semester almost on, I don't think we've reached to Africa, I think we're still in Middle East or the Mediterranean, not even Middle East, Mediterranean cuisine. So for me, I'm wondering how do you, how are you gonna partner with schools who have catering or culinary as a, um, in high school and also in colleges to ensure that we're now telling those stories of the influences of ingredients that are brought to, America from Africa and the, some of the recipes and the dishes that we use, because I'm also finding out, and I'm, I'm from South Sudan, so I've been here for six years, and I'm finding out where I work. Even the chefs don't know some of the recipes they talk about. I'm like, hold on, this seems like an African ingredient. And I'm like, do you know where it comes from? And they say no, and I'm shocked because I'm thinking we should know all that. Then I'm realizing there's a gap in the system 
We think all these food systems originated in Europe. When people have been cooking amazing dishes, whether it's in Latin America or in the Middle East, in Africa, but we take from that and then it becomes a trend. To some people, it's a dairy cuisine. I hate the word trend when it's somebody's daily cuisine. Or I hate fusion. Fusion as well. That's another one. Yeah. You can create your yeah. own stand it up. Right? Come on, come on, chef. Come on, yeah, come right. on, on chef. Slow. Bring it home. These chairs are hard. <laughs> Bring it home. <laughs> Next year, comfortable chairs. We out of time. Know. Bring it home. Um, <laughs> okay. Yes. I was, I was just gonna say, how can we? Because I think we have to partner. Because for me, the systems were created already. So especially, I don't want to join the system, but unfortunately, our children and future generations are going through the education system. And they need to have this even in curriculum to say, hey, the okra came from blah, blah. I ate gumbo in America. And I'm like, hold on. This sounds like something in South Sudan we eat called swala. I was like, wait a minute. Why don't they talk about, why weren't they talking about New Orleans cuisine and the influence of Africans? Mm -hmm. I only heard of the French influence a lot, but you taste it. So I'm really curious. How do you plan to, or would you like to partner? Is there a way or do you, are you already doing that? Thank you. Sorry, I took a I'm on the panel now. Oh, they're ready for the next session. Okay, yeah. Okay, hey. Um, for me, we got to go back. We got to go back. And it's not even, I mean, a lot of historians don't even know, right? And I mean, every day is, it's exciting to me because of the curiosity of finding out where our food really came from. And I say we have to go not just to the food, we need to go to the roots. We got to go back to where, where this food originally came from. Not just the recipe, but really understanding the ingredients. Understanding the herbal ingredients and the medicinal, where it came from, why we have it, what it's used for, what it was used for in my culture. I saw it in my great-grandmother's um, pantry, but the story was never told forward, right? So the storytelling and being able to have these conversations, they need to be brought down to the elementary school. We need to start talking about where our food comes from, how it's planted, but we keep stopping at the United States. We keep stopping at America. We need to understand that we were brought over here. Everybody in the, except the indigenous, we were brought over here. Where did that food originate from? What did it transfer into? What are we currently doing in this time? And I'm hoping within the food culture and then within food, I'm hoping to bring here to Austin that I'm able to do that and tell a story with every dish because every dish has a story. That burger has a story you ate earlier today. It came from somebody's farm somewhere. And I think that's the understanding, and I'll leave it with this, is like our food comes from a farm. Everything you are eating, even though it may be a commercial farm, it comes from a farmer. We need to have appreciation for all of them. Thank you. Thank you. You've just lit my fire. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on the topic of where food comes from, I want to honor you for your work and the many thousands of individuals that soon will get up and make the long trips up north and across the country to work on white-owned farms to pick what we eat. We cannot forget about the abuse, the oppression, the deaths that will happen soon as people will get in multiple families in cars to go work in white owned farms to feed us and pay a price oftentimes of dying. There are children in those fields, black and brown children, picking food while there's still pesticide being sprayed. That is who brings food to our table. I honor you for bringing that to light. Thank you. I thank you very much. And I mean, when I'm, when I'm talking about farming has that violence and death in that history, it's current. This is, has not stopped, it's continued on. So I am about to be kicked off stage. If you see any of us and you wanna have a conversation with us, please do stop and talk to us. You see, we open, we, we willing to talk. Thank you all so much.